Good afternoon and, and um, welcome to this um, GovConnect seminar looking at uh, the use of digital technology in mental health care. Uh, you're, you're very welcome and, and it's great to see already a nice good number of people are here watching us. Uh, if you're watching us live, you might be having your lunch. Uh, if you're watching this on a recording, you might be having your dinner or breakfast tomorrow, who knows, but, but uh, thank you for joining us and, and being part of this conversation today. Um, my name's Andy Bell and I work at Centre for Mental Health. We're an independent charity. Hopefully you've heard, across, heard of us and come across our work. Um, if you have, well done, that, that's the first, first good thing to know. Um, if you haven't, do take a look. Uh, my job here today, however, is not to tell you about our work, but, but to chair this conversation and introduce three fantastic speakers who are going to speak from, from positions of, of knowledge on this important topic uh, of, of digital mental health support. Um, by way of introduction, there's not much I really want to say apart from the fact that, that we know that, that um, of recent times digital has become an incredibly important means of providing people with support for their mental health, uh, some of that not by choice. But inevitably within that, we then have to start asking questions about well, what do we want to do with it? What's the right way of using digital technology rather than the old debate about should we have it or not? I think we need to know what does good look like? What should we be buying for people? What should we be providing? How should we be working? How can we adapt what we've always done to, to acknowledge the new world we're in? So that's the topic I hope that we'll talk about today. To get us started, um, and we've got a nice number of people who are now uh, in the call, is I'm going to do a couple of polling questions just so that you're engaged and, and, and part of the conversation. So, so um, I'm hoping Rob will do some magic, uh, Rob Daniels, who's organising this conference, uh, to, to, to bring the polls in to, to your attention. And I think it's probably on the chat function. Is that right? Um, I can't see it, but hopefully the, the, the polls will appear on, on the screen. Um, and we've got three questions for you to get you started. Um, yes, there's actually a thing called polls. Well, that would help, wouldn't it? So first of all, what's the weather like where you are? Okay, mostly sunny. Well, that's good. And some people have snow, you, you lucky people. I don't know if you're having a, a snow day at school today, but, but um, okay. So that's the first question, just to make sure that, that we know where we are and more than 50% are sunny. So hopefully that's putting you in a positive disposition. Uh, if we can go to the next poll, this is somewhat more about the topic. And what we really want to know here is, is how confident are you in, in using digital technology to provide mental health support? This will give us an idea of, of where you all are. Um, and I would say, well, that's interesting. Most people kind of somewhere in the middle, but about a third not confident at all. And that means you're the right people for this event, because I think we need to start from that position of, of um, knowing that this is hard and complicated uh, and well done to the nine percent who are confident good for you um and and uh, we've all got lots to learn from each other okay and and then the last question which, which i think uh, will come in a moment is really just to look at um what things have been like in the pandemic for you so so have the services you're, you're working in or in your local area if you're a user of services have they got better and if so a lot a little um or not at all well no only one person said worse so so that's reassuring uh, but in most cases yeah a, a, a little better and and um about a quarter saying a lot better so i think that's encouraging certainly there is an overall feeling that, that things are improving so that's good um and I think that brings us to the end of, of the polling. So there you go. Uh, there is a, a chat function uh, where you can ask questions for the speakers. And I will be keeping an eye on that while the speakers are doing their thing uh, and, and putting the questions to them. Uh, so, so we may not get through all of them during the session. If we don't, then, then I'm sure there'll be a way of making sure that, that, that we can put those afterwards. But, but please do put your questions in the chat and I will be taking very careful notes and, and asking as many as I can. Uh, there are also, uh, there's also something called a file tray, which if you look on the right hand side of your screen, you should see underneath the polls uh, and the presentations will all be there. So you don't have to write notes uh, of, oh look, it's even a little red spot next to it, that's good. Um, so you don't have to write very detailed notes of what you hear. It will all be there to take away afterwards and a recording of this session will be available. Okay. Time to move on, and I'm really pleased that, that we have uh, with us the National Clinical Director for Mental Health, uh, Professor Tim Kendall uh, from NHS England and Improvement. Tim, 
floor is yours. Uh, well, I'll need some slides, which um, I'm hoping will appear, and they have appeared. That's fantastic. Okay, so um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm the National Clinical Director for Mental Health um, in England, um, and I'm also a consultant psychiatrist working in Sheffield with homeless people with mental health problems. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so to start off, I just want to make sure everyone understands where we are. Um, in 2016, when I started this job, um, we were seeing about one in four children uh, who had mental health problems. So through, through one means or another, we were not seeing three out of four children. And it's a pretty similar picture in adults. And uh, usually that's achieved by keeping the, the bar pretty high um, for people to get in. Um, and actually, what say, say in kids, they would say, generally speaking, when they got into services, they got quite a good job, um, quite a good deal, but it was just incredibly difficult to get in. Now, with the five year forward view, we have managed to invest an additional billion pounds a year into mental health services, children and adults. Um, and that has led us to increase the number of kids that we're seeing, for example, from one in four up to just over one in three. But we still have a long way to go. So whilst I'm going to say some very positive, optimistic things about what we're doing, bear in mind we are starting from a low base. And that's really important to remember. So when you look at what's in front of you, this is the long-term plan. And these are the sort of things that we agreed we would do um, that, you know, uh, so we'll see 345,000 more young people, for example, and that we're, 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 we're developing uh, mental health service into schools, that kind of thing. Uh, major thing that we're doing, though, in the long term plan, which started in 2019, um, is uh, is that we're investing in community mental health, which, to be honest, I think has been doing very badly. Um, this is for adults. Uh, has been doing pretty badly. So um, we're going to be investing about one billion pounds extra in community mental health. So you can read the rest all, all yourselves. So next slide. So this is what we've actually achieved with the long term plan. Um, and I'm just going to pick out a few of these. So one of them, third point down, is that we have uh, we've set up 180 mental health support teams working into schools and uh we we're we're um uh, you know when this is complete um we will have will have doubled the size of the health we're providing for kids so um quite that will be some significant achievement um uh, you'll see at number six that we've given out £70 million of transformation funding to 12 sites, which we are um, investing into community mental health for people with serious mental health problems. So that's eating disorders, uh, people with personality disorders, and people with psychoses, including those who need rehab. And from those 12 sites, we will start to invest um, well, continue to invest um, nationally um, starting in April on the basis of those 12 sites, we'll have a better understanding of how we can roll this out. And it's basically to have a community service which doesn't say no, um, which, you know, if, if you go to Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, um, before we started uh, putting the investment in, they were turning away eight out of 10 people referred into their community teams and now they're seeing 10 out of 10 so that's that's where we want to get to um, next slide please um, so this is what you know the long-term plan set out that we would have um, uh, yeah, a, a major focus on enabling digitally enabled healthcare, care um, and that this would be properly integrated into services um, now, um, you know, it's, it's a great idea, um, but you know, to be honest, before COVID, it was it was quite a struggle to get that um, up and running. Um, 
So next slide. Um, uh, COVID has transformed things. Now, um, let, let's just have a little look at what COVID has done to the population. Um, we know from lots of surveys there's been a huge impact on levels of anxiety, levels of depression. Um, uh, and one group that I think has particularly done badly have been people with existing mental health problems. So um, their levels of depression, anxiety, and so on have remained high throughout the, the pandemic. Another group that I think have done really not well have been young women. So you may have seen the Office for National Statistics survey, uh, which repeated a study done in 2017. Uh, and, and what they've shown is that, that young people in, in general, that their levels of mental health problems have gone from one in eight up to one in six. And the group that have suffered the most are young women between 17 and 22, who now have 27% uh, of them have a diagnosable mental health problem. And that's double the rate for the same age group for young men. So um, things, um, things have been quite stressful. And this morning, we looked at data for young people with eating disorders and the referral rates in under 18 year olds have doubled over the last year. So a lot of stress there. Pleased to say the suicide rate has not changed at this point in time. Um, next slide, please. Impact on mental health services, you can see from this. So those graphs on the right are the impact on IAPT. And this is uh, sort of uh, mirrored across much of mental health services. We, we have maintained uh, health services have been open. Uh, and despite um, people going off sick with COVID or isolating because of exposure to COVID cases, et cetera. Um, we have actually kept everything open, but the referral rates dropped massively um, uh, in uh, end of March last year, as you can see in the top, uh, top graph. They have gradually come back up, but not entirely back to where they were. Um, what you will notice though, in the bottom um, uh, graph, is that the recovery rates in IAPT have actually improved. Um, now, um, one of the things that you will uh, all be aware of, I'm sure, is that we have moved from doing face-to-face -face work um, in a lot of services, community mental health services, and in IAPT in particular, we've moved from face-to-face -to, -face to remote uh, contact. So what that really amounts to is telephone and video um, video meetings, video conference meetings. So um, uh, very pleased to be able to say that that shift um, in IAPT, where we've got good outcome data, has not resulted in poorer outcomes, but in fact in slightly better outcomes. Um, and our understanding from speaking to people is that, that that's, that's because people quite often prefer to be able to stay at home rather than hang around in waiting rooms before they see people. So let's 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 see what happens to that. So next slide, please. So what have we what what have we done to adapt to the pandemic? Well, um, we've got new funding. We've got fifty million fund for improving uh, our response to uh, winter, um, and that includes uh, improving the setting. Uh, investment in dormitories and so on. We've got an additional 500 million, which is largely, which starts in April. That will largely be uh, focused on accelerating the long-term plan. Because our view is that the response to this, to, to the pandemic, is that we've got to step up um, and, and move more quickly on developing community-based services, crisis services, et cetera. Now, one of the things that we have done two years ahead of time is to make sure that we've got 24-7, uh, every locality has got 
uh, helpline within their mental health services that's open 24 7 so crisis lines now if you go on to nhs.uk backslash talk you will be able to you can put your postcode in and it will tell you what's the phone number for your most local crisis line so that's great news um and uh let's move to the next slide um uh, i don't think we need to say much about that because i think we're running out of time so move to the next slide again now that i think is quite a good graphic um display of what's actually happened in reality if you look the the orange uh, stuff is uh, is the use of uh, telephone contacts. The um, the yellow is the use of video conferencing. And if you look, the uh, stuff on the left, where it's community mental health, you can see that whereas face-to-face uh, -face was 80% of contacts, um, by April, that had dropped to about 35% and telephone had shot up. And that's been the case across most services, as you can see, with face-to-face -face gradually coming back up, but not back to uh, the usual. Now, um, if you look at IAPT, effectively, they've moved to being a remote service. And um, really pleased about the outcome data that reassures me that that is that's not causing terrible problems. But you will notice that in some of these services, specialist perinatal mental health and in IAPT, that the video side of this is gradually increasing. And it's, it's our expectation um, that uh, this shift towards um, video and telephone uh, will presage a shift towards digital more uh, more concretely so next slide please so what are we going to do from here on um we are going to um we're going to retain what what um new methods we've we've used to communicate with people um we want to build on that and develop more in terms of digital um uh, stuff um and use it as a choice so it's not that we want to have everybody doing digital mental health. Um, you know, from my point of view, I work with homeless people. Um, I, I have phone calls with a couple of people who are in hostels, homeless hostels, who can't, I can't go and see them. But the vast majority of people I've been seeing face to face all the way through. So this is not that we're going to move everything to digital or everything to telephone, but we are going to give people much more choice um uh and you know it's as i say accelerate the long-term plan the long-term plan is the right solution we just have to get there quicker next slide please and embedding embedding digital transformation i mean the real message from this is that if we can move in a matter of a month from uh 80 of people being seen face to face uh, to roughly the same proportion being seen by telephone and by video conferencing, we can do that with digital. Um, and, you know, that, that is our intention and, and you yeah, know, that's part of the long-term plan. Next slide, please. I think these final two slides are all the different ways that we intend to use uh digital and uh, uh, di digital transformation so you know behind the scenes we are working with lots of partners to uh to develop apps uh so that people can uh talk on their phones um uh, as well as doing video conferencing and telephones and so on next slide please i think this is the final one um yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you look around mental health services and very quickly people are beginning now to uh, to, to go into a digital world. So let's say it's, it's already here. It's already here. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank I mean, you, that may be being a little over optimistic, but um, the speed with which people have moved to to using telephones and fa uh, video conferencing is a testament to how much we could shift um uh, using other platforms so 
I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that we can do it. And it does, you know, it expands our choice. Thank you. And and that's that's a great way to end because I think that that in, in many ways is about it's so important we go back to those basic values about fair access to support and, and, and choice of what, what help you get for your mental health. So so some really good stuff there. Um if you're if you're okay, Tim, we've got loads of questions for you, but I might hold them to the end and that way you can share those with Miriam and Dan. Is that okay? Yep. Brilliant. Okay. In in that case, we will we'll move on. And and um, I'm now really pleased to say that 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 um, we're heading to uh, City and Hackney uh, for for uh, two fantastic speakers. Uh, we have uh, Dan Burningham from City and Hackney CCG uh, and Dr. Miriam Grover from East London NHS Foundation Trust uh, to talk us through a real life example of of working with digital technology. Um, I've seen a bit of a preview of it. It's fantastic. So, so uh, Miriam and Dan, over to you. Thank you. Um, so, well, I um, would like to pick up rather nicely from um, Tim's point about how do we avoid saying no? I think that's almost the premise of our, of our work. Um, so uh, now to get control of the slides, I think I just click this slide thing, don't I? I'm pretty certain. Yeah. Um, so let's just see if that works. Okay, yeah. And it looks like Dan's accidentally left the room. Are you all right to pick up while Dan comes back, Miriam? Yes, yes, just bear with me just a second. Okay, so in 2018, people from City and Hackney, particularly those accessing the advocacy project, lived with an experience of severe mental illness where they had written care plans. They shared their frustrations with us. These care plans, they didn't sufficiently involve them. The information was in different places. It wasn't shared with them or other people involved in their support. And these are some of the um, comments that the service users said, you know, they couldn't access them when they wanted them. Often they felt it was a bit of a tick box exercise. They felt that it was a, a bit of a lecture and, and there was nothing to keep them contemporaneous. They, they kind of, the care plans weren't keeping up with the changes that people were experiencing in their lives. And there's a mountain of unmet needs. City and Hackney has one of, well, has the third highest level of severe mental illness in England. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry, I clicked out then. It just completely collapsed. Sorry about that. No worries, I, I, I took your place. There you go, you can start down with the mountain of unmet need. Um, that's great. Yeah, so um, I, th I was going to say that um, our focus of this has been severe mental illness. Um, and there's been a lot of work done in IAPT. Um, IAPT's grown exponentially. And um, um, but but there's been less investment in severe mental illness until recently. And I think as a result, we have a, a mountain of unmet need. Um, in City and Hatton, we've got the third highest um, uh, level of SMI population. And by SMI, we mean people with bipolar, um, psychosis, personality disorders and trauma. Um, and we only really have enough therapists to see about 8% of of the 12,000 people on the SMI register um, with, with anything longer than a with with 12 with anything longer than a very very short treatment. So so we've 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 really not got enough to to avoid to come back to Tim's point. How do we avoid saying no? We've not got enough therapists to actually see everybody. Um, and of course, COVID has made the needs greater for this group and it's also made it harder to reach people as well. Um, many of this group are actually in um, primary care at any one point in time so they're not necessarily in secondary care where there is specialist psychotherapy. Um, most of what they have access to is often the voluntary sector. Um, so great, next next slide please. Um, yeah, so um, what some service users have described is, is, is facing a cliff edge at the point of discharge. So, uh, in other words, they have care plans, but, um, but those care plans actually 
um, they, they're not carried through into primary care. And so, so when they leave secondary care, there's really nothing for them to sustain them or give them structure. Uh, next slide, please. So what we've come up with is one of the driving forces was the idea of a kind of digital staircase that something, in other words, something that takes, that something that people can carry with them on their journey from secondary care to primary care and when the patient moves around between organisations. Um, and so what we wanted was, was a platform, a digital platform that service users can access, they can see their recovery care plan, they can have access to other tools and it follows the person. Um, and, and, and it follows them wherever they go. Uh, next slide, please. So the way the way we did this was to was to start from the point that the patient has access to the data. So if the patient owns the data, then they can they can share it with other organisations, and that solves the problem of transfer, particularly with voluntary sector organisations where it's quite difficult, it's been quite difficult to connect, but also between secondary care systems and primary care systems. So patient owns the data on the platform, that was the first thing. And the second thing is that the platform brings everything together in one place. So a lot of service users complain there were lots of versions of recovery care plans and other bits of planning weren't there. So what our platform does is it takes the service users recovery goals and it brings it together with also um, personal health information such as, you know, BMI, exercise, diet, um, um, blood pressure, all those sort of things that might inform, say, fitness goals. It brings it together with personal health budgets. So you have finances to achieve those goals. There's a library of, uh, of resources that the services you can access. There's a log. Uh, to keep a personal diary and record outcome measures. And then all of that information can be shared with all the people that are involved with the person. It might be uh, they're in, uh, we have an organisation called Core Sport and where they provide sports coaching, um, they're advocacy workers, primary care mental health workers, local GP, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this can, person can connect by text or video call to everybody and also share what they've done as well. Great. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other really important premise of this is that because the platform is service user owned, it is designed by the service user. In other words, they can select what they want to put on the platform. It's flexible. They can add apps. They can take apps away. They design their own goals. They set their own uh, personal health budget um, and also, they can decide who they're going to share information with and when. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now I'm going to pass over to uh, Miriam. So one aspect of our platform is our collaborative work with SilverCloud. Programs like SilverCloud are developed with people uh, with mild to moderate common mental health problems in mind. They're generally not considered for use with people with severe mental health problems and SilverCloud hasn't been trialled with this population prior to our collaboration with them. There were various factors, as Dan said, that needed attention in Hackney, such as high demand, greater need, and then a global pandemic added into the mix. Um, digital platforms could be a part of that solution. We had to think about how we could work differently. It was time to be bold. As a little pun here, it was time for therapists to consider their own thoughts, feelings and behaviour in relation to digital treatments and to challenge their own biases and fears. Lots of concerns about issues such as managing risk had to be heard and worked through. And my experience tends to be with issues such as digital platforms, the, the, the conversation about clinical risk comes up and, and, and can often shut down any further discussion. And now, We've found a way of working that we don't have to close down those conversations. We don't have to close down those ideas. Um, these programs can be effectively used even in home treatment teams. These are the results of the Silver Cloud trial in my service, the Specialist Psychotherapy Service. Um, and it doesn't, the, the numbers across the whole of secondary care and city in Hackney are, are larger than this, but I'm going to focus particularly within my service. 
129 of our service users are actively using the program, either with some clinician support or purely as a self-help um, treatment. What's really fabulous about uh, this, this work is that it's very live. Um, the, this data changes over time. Um, as time goes on, if I'd been giving this presentation a few months ago, these numbers would have looked quite different as it stands at the moment. The average number of sessions that each person using the platform is completing is 16, which is really quite high, and people are using around 20 minutes per session. Now we have core scores, uh, we have paired core scores for uh, some of the people using the programme, and 86% 80 of those core scores indicated that people are saying that their mental health has stopped deteriorating or it's been improving while they've been using the programme. And 83% of people said that using Silver Cloud is actually helping them make progress towards their goals. And I think that's really interesting because it does show us that Silver Cloud does have a place in secondary care. It does have a place with people with quite severe mental health problems. It is helping them meet their goals. And the, the beauty of using Silver Cloud is that service users can continue to access those programs for as long as they're needed. They may have a period in their lives, perhaps they don't need it so much. Maybe things become a bit difficult for them. It becomes a challenge and then uh, they can go back to the program. Miriam, can you go as close to your mic as you can? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me at all? It's quite faint. OK, I'll, I'll speak louder. I'd like to tell you about somebody called Sally. Sa Sally is a patient of mine. Uh, she has significant mental health problems. Uh, she has a severe dissociative disorder and she's had numerous mm. admissions to hospital due to her mental health or due to physical health complications resulting from her mental health. And she has for her life felt excluded from most healthcare services. Sally and I developed a care plan for her to help her manage some of the challenges of life. It was really important to her. She had her care plan laminated uh, so that she could show it to other healthcare staff so that they could understand her and her needs and so that she could improve her access to care. But the problem is, is then she needed to ensure that she was carrying the document wherever she went hope that her bag wasn't stolen from her when she was in a dissociative state, which could quite often happen. Using this platform meant that Sally now has a virtual backpack with all of the tools that she needs uh, and she has immediate online access to them. Her care plans are there, her crisis plans are there, she can access her silver cloud therapies through there, she has a personal health budget. She can access that information on there. She can send me messages. We can update her care plans. We can share resources. We can share ideas. Um, she can share them with other services. She can share them with her family. She can share them with her carers. She can decide to stop doing that if she wishes. It's a very live system for her. So this is this is Sally's story. Here she now she's she's able to access me via digital means. She can use her personal health budget to help her to access resources that promote her well-being in the community. One thing that's really important for her is she can share this crisis plan with people such as paramedics who may come to her house. The, the plan shows the paramedics or the other healthcare professionals how to help Sally and help to get the best out of their, their treatment to her by understanding her mental health problems better. In Sally's own words, she was brought up to be not seen and definitely not heard. And due to this, she was left completely unable to ask for any help at all, regardless of the situation. As she said, the platform has given me the ability to be as self-caring as possible for the first time. I'm no longer reliant on my daughter and a few other people to speak for me and access care for me. I feel I'm not alone in self-caring as I'm doing it with the backup of health professionals who know me well. And for the first time, health professionals who do not know me and the problems I face have become accessible to me. I can now access care in a way I have never been able to before. The 
platform empowers patients to set and achieve their goals. 80% of patients using the platform for more than nine months have made progress in achieving their goals, with 60% of those people fully achieving them. Also, 72% of people showed improvement and 52% of the participants showed significant improvement in their mental well-being. These figures are higher than those achieved in traditional secondary care services in recent years. Previously, patients waited to access psychological therapy services for an average of about seven and a half months between referral and treatment. This platform has transformed the way that we work by creating a continuous cycle of review and modification. This means the assessment of what the patient needs is now ongoing and integrated with the treatment. It's also co-produced with both the patient and the therapist. As a result, assessment and treatment can now start earlier, reducing waiting times to just two to three weeks. Also, because the pl platform is continuously being looked at by the patient and professionals, it's much easier to track and respond to risks. And as I mentioned earlier, risk management is often something that really puts people off using digital platforms with, with this kind of population. So for example, mm -hmm. our crisis resolution and home treatment team were able to instantly view and respond to suicidal ideation on patient logs. The platform has provided digital support to nearly 700 people with severe mental illness. Next year, we've budgeted to expand to 4,000 in City and Hackney. And the following year, it's planned that the platform will be rolled out across North East London ICP to reach an estimated 20,000. The platform has reduced some of the financial inequality that people with severe mental illness face. 424 people have been supported financially to achieve their goals through personal health budgets. And 222 people have been connected to digital services. 36% of platform users are from our African Caribbean heritage backgrounds, our largest BAME group in Hackney. The platform significantly reduces cost per patient because patients work more independently, reducing our face-to-face -face time by 50%. That means we can restretch our resources further to see more people. The digital nature of the platform means it's easily scalable and there are significant economies of scale in relation to our license costs and initial design costs. Within an alliance structure, we've brought together secondary care, primary care and voluntary care organisations with technical support from Silver Cloud and Patients Know Best. Through a series of workshops, organisations work together with service users to design a platform shaped by what service users have said is needed and is important to them. Service users and staff tested the platform. Adjustments were made according to the feedback provided and the updated platform was made more widely available to local service users. Ongoing feedback is collated to ensure that the digital platform remains relevant and supportive of service user needs. By putting service users at the centre of this process and understanding their need for more choice, control and flexibility, there's been a shift in the way that the services are delivered. Static plans have become interactive plans. Service users are no longer recipients, but they're proactive agents in their own recovery. And standalone treatments have become blended, personalised packages. Over to Dan. Yes, we'd just like to finish. This is our last slide. We'd just like to finish on, I think this story sort of illustrates many of those points about the cultural change. And also this is this is another person with severe mental illness with complex needs. And I think the thing about the platform is that it, it does suit people with complex needs because it offers a range of inputs. Um, so this is a story of Peter. And um, you know, it, it, Peter didn't have a mobile phone. We well, had a mobile phone, but it wasn't a smartphone, so he couldn't actually access um, the platform 
or any of the kind of connectivity. Um, and so he had a personal health budget. He was given a personal health budget to buy a smartphone. Um, and with the smartphone, he was able to access the platform. He then set recovery goals for himself, which were quite detailed actually, but in basically it was a lot around confidence and getting a job and moving towards that. And then also reducing his loneliness socially um, and, and getting fit. Um, and in his own words, I mean, what he says is that when the coronavirus pandemic hit and everything closed or moved online, I found it very hard. Without the new phone, I wouldn't be able to feel as connected as I do. I would have really struggled. Now I'm the fittest I've ever been. and the ex I exercise more during the week than I ever have done. My confidence has also grown. Um, he's put his name forward for a peer-led tennis uh, session thing. She now does tennis coaching. He's applying for a, a tennis coaching qualification. Um, and he also takes part in the design groups that's shaping, um, coming back to that idea of an iterative process, he takes part in the design groups that shape how we develop the platform. Um, and he's been very active in those groups. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that that kind of really uh, embodies a lot of what we are trying to achieve. And you can see his um, his best ever um, exercise score below as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Dan and Miriam, and, and uh, a really comprehensive and interesting presentation and, and uh, really grateful for it. And, and um, I think a, a lot of the uh, responses on the chat show that there's a lot of interest in this. Um, some of the interest in the chat is on quite specific things, like, like how often you take people's scores and, and how they get their kind of physical health info. Uh, I wonder if it's possible to, to answer those in the chat rather, rather than, than to... Um, uh, do it in the conversation because I think there are some quite big picture um, questions that, that it might be useful to get to. Um, uh, and, and I'm hoping that you might uh, uh, possibly post details of how anyone who's interested in, in using this or developing something like it locally, uh, how they might go about it. Um, because I think that's incredibly important that, that anyone here gets the benefit of that. Just, just to respond briefly also to, to Mutaz, yes, uh, a recording will be available. Um, later this afternoon um, and, and uh, I'm sure the team at GovConnect will explain how you can get hold of that. Um, so, so normally when I chair something like this I write a few questions down for myself in case nobody has one but but you, you, you've done an amazing job because there are hundreds of, oh, I'm, I'm exaggerating, dozens of questions um, for all the speakers so I'm going to do my best to get through them as quickly as I can and uh, I'm going to ask panelists maybe to, to uh, self-select who answers so you don't all have to answer all the questions or else we will be here all day. Um, so um, first of all I think there are loads of questions about inequalities and particularly relating to digital exclusion uh, and some of that relates to people in poverty and Tim you've spoken about folk who are homeless for example but also we've had questions about people who are deaf and hard of hearing uh, we've had questions about people who can't afford the hardware uh, and and, and uh, how can NHS organizations or, or, or others working alongside them help to, to narrow that digital divide for some people is it just about having face-to-face -face options for those who can't afford it or, or, or have impairments or, or are there kind of ways around that using the technology? Um, shall I answer? Go for it. Okay. Um, now, um, what some people do, say, in some homeless services in London, is that they somebody arrives at um, you know, A and E or wherever, um, they're given a phone, so they can stay in touch and. You know, in, in where that's happening, um, they're saying this is a really effective use of resources because you stay in touch with them and, and so on. Now, um, not everywhere can do that, but I think the bottom line is that you've got to provide a service. So, you know, I, I, I'm not, no one gets excluded, but if someone says to me, you know, they've got a phone and, you know, and it, it's more convenient for, for them for us to speak on the phone, that's, absolutely fine from my point of view now for the future i hope all services will start to provide some of the technology to give people access um because you know i i think there's no doubt that you know f for a lot of people um you know things like outpatients you, you just you wouldn't do outpatients anymore um you know you, you would do it by video conferencing 
Um, and, you know, different parts of medicine are suited to this more than others. Um, but I think for mental health, I, I think there's no doubt that you can do an awful lot through digital means, you know, which promotes choice, which, you know, flexibility, um, access and so on. So um, I think we need to invest. I, I think you'll, you'll, you'll have many of us absolutely backing you up on that one and, and, and feeling very strongly that that's right. Is, is there a particular challenge? Obviously, obviously you work in Sheffield and, and uh, colleagues in City and Hackney. Is there a particular challenge, though, in rural areas uh, where digital connectivity is, is sometimes a major challenge? And, and uh, any thoughts that, that, that you might have about that, Tim? I, I think, actually, what's happened is, is phenomenal. Um, so... Uh, in the past, if you're a student and you went from, uh, you know, Sheffield and you, know, you went to London, um, about half or, or more will forget that they've got to transfer their GP. Yeah. So, so now, of course, they can stay in touch with their GP remotely. The mm. GPs are all set up to do that. Um, and if they want uh, access to IAPT, they can now access IAP back at home. Now, I'm not saying that's always the best way of doing it, um, and we are exploring ways of making sure people don't fall in any gaps uh, that, that might open up. But it, it has made a big difference, and the same would apply for rural areas. Um, there is pretty good randomized control trial evidence that when you compare CBT for anxiety, some anxiety conditions, done by telephone or done face-to-face, -face, the effect sizes are pretty comparable. Mm. So, you know, uh, I, I'm not saying everyone should do it, but where it suits, that's an obvious way to do it. Brilliant. Thank you. And and I love that that thing about some of those geographical divides just, just disappearing almost overnight when, when you've got that capability. I think there's something very powerful about that. And, and um, Miriam and Dan, you, you work in an area where digital exclusion will be quite commonplace and particularly among people living with long term mental health challenges. Uh, you, you, you've been clearly making a huge amount of progress. Are, are there any particular steps you've had to take to to uh, address digital exclusion for, for any particular groups of people? And have you been surprised by any that have been perhaps more positive or, or more difficult than you expected? Can I take this, Dan? Yeah, sure. I, I think, um, kind of as, as we've mentioned, you know, there, there is a um, quite a high level of poverty in City and Hackney. And um, so we have made quite extensive use of personal health budgets to uh, as been mentioned to purchase the equipment but also to um give guidance for service users on how to use the equipment properly so it is um it's been really important not just to say uh, here's a tablet here's a laptop or here's a phone it's also to say do you know how to use it can we help you can we can can we give you some guidance with that and i've been um very encouraged by how positive our population has been in embracing this technology. It, it, it isn't that there hasn't been a will to use it. It's, it's just simply that they've needed financial and also education support to use them. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, the update's been pretty good and it's been pretty good across BAME groups as well as I think we discussed, which is good. I mean, there are some exceptions. We've got a big Orthodox Jewish population in the north of Hackney. Um, there are issues around the internet with that particular group. Um, but by and large, and we've had to sort of do things like translate, do translations as well for Turkish speaking. But I mean, generally, it's it's it, the, the uptake is much bigger and faster than we would have been anticipated, really. That's really encouraging news. Thank you. And you've anticipated some of the other questions in some of your answers there. So, so that, that's excellent. Um, a couple of interesting questions have come in. And, and um, one, one, I think that, again, you, you, you may have thought about in City and Hackney and, and uh, others, others as well. Uh, this, this slightly knotty issue of digital security, privacy, GDPR, some of the kind of legislation uh, and kind of protections for, for the use of digital technology. And people are putting really quite personal information on these uh platforms or, or sharing quite personal things through through digital therapy 
uh, what 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 thoughts of, of of any of you got about how we maintain security and privacy for people um, in in what can be quite a, a kind of worrying uh, situation for some? Well, I, I mean, I think this 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 came up a lot. It was a big anxiety on the part of the service user group. So when we we started with a consultation with them, they were the drivers behind the design. They formed the design group. One of the issues they did mention a lot. I mean, I think. Some of their anxieties were about kind of big data being used. And I think that that was easy to deal with that in terms of the products we're using, the platform um, like Silver Cloud. We also use Patient Knows Best platform as well. They'd already done tests on the security of their data. So and we are monitoring that. I mean, that's as part of the pilot. We're monitoring the risk but in terms of sort of that end of it. Um, you know that there was a kind of there's an answer to that and that's something you know is, is solvable the other bit i think is the service user has responsibility for sharing the data and they could inadvertently share it with people they don't want to share it or you know they you know you so but it comes that 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 could happen with iact or any of the other services we, we we're using digitally or or you know most of mental health is now going online and has similar issues so i think that you know, that's just something that people will have to get used to. Now, service users will on their phone have a lot more personal information and they could potentially share that with lots of people. Um, so that's just something that maybe we need to sort of, you know, people need to think about and, and think about how they are sharing stuff. I don't know if you want to, and Miriam wants to add to that from the therapy point of view, how it works in terms of, you know, people holding their own records and logs and stuff. I think I, I mean, the only thing I'd like to add to that really is is that, you know, people do hold their own records. Uh, you know, if they're on paper, they will hold their own therapy logs, their own journals, their own diaries. A lot of the service users that I've spoken to have said, well, they actually feel a lot more comfortable having those on their telephone or on their tablet or something. You know, a family member or something is not going to come into a room and pick up a folder thinking, what's that? And then start seeing book records from their therapy. Um, the, 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 there's, there's been actually a very positive viewpoint from, from the service users point of view. But it is a, I mean, it's a major issue, this, isn't it? I mean, you know, on the one hand, the benefits of, of, uh, you know, of having, you know, an electronic patient record and being able to communicate much more easily and flexibly and giving choice and all this kind of stuff. Um, as soon as you put data on, on a, uh, you know, on a computer, uh, or a phone or, well, much the same thing, um, it, it does represent a security problem. Um, and yeah, so there are lots of sophisticated sort of bits of software and so on, which which try and guard against the wrong people getting access to confidential information. And I guess that's that's what we are reliant on, which is you know, having having technical solutions that make it much less likely that people's data is accessible whilst at the same time maintaining the accessibility of services and and so on. So it, it, it's a really difficult problem. Um, and everyone knows that about their bank accounts and yeah, much the same way. I mean, it's, I would have thought your bank account's more vulnerable because there's more in it that people will want. Yeah, no, that, that's uh, th 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 this is one that's going to run and run and run and run. And I suspect there may at some point be the uh, benefits in in maybe uh, NHSX or others mm -hmm. thinking about what what help and support they might offer, particularly to local organisations or smaller organisations using tech solutions, uh, because there may well be a benefit there in kind of collecting together shared knowledge. Um, the role of the voluntary and community sector has come out strongly and, and clearly in City and Hackney you're working with BCS partners and, and um, I think one, one particularly interesting question was actually that there is a significant workforce out there not in the NHS working in voluntary and community organisations or indeed elsewhere in faith groups and, and community organisations that aren't always mental health but there is skill and knowledge and and how can we uh, how can we bring them into the, this kind of field and, and create the right kind of capacity if you like to, to bring that that um skill and knowledge in into into this kind of world of, of digital uh mental health support um 
I mean, absolutely. I mean, that was one of that was one of the big driving forces that the, the voluntary sector weren't connected and they weren't part of the kind of big data projects. You know, the, the trusts and, and the primary care systems were not that those projects, I have to say, have got that far in terms of integrating systems. But but I think primary care, you know, just wasn't integrated and not, and 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 it, and it was and it is the support system for a lot of people with long term severe mental illness in in primary care settings. So, so getting getting the primary care organisations on board, like Core Sports for Us and the Advocacy Project, was really was really key. That meant they had the personal health budget information, they had the sports coaches. You know, it was really, really fantastic. And there's so much work done also in terms of sort of cultural groups, you know, grassroots cultural organisations are really important as well for people. Um, and, and, you know, so so the more the more groups the more groups that come on board, the better. And, and what's interesting about people with severe mental illness is often there's lots of different organisations involved in their care at any one time. And some of them are quite small, really. Um, so connecting everybody up is, 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 is a good thing. Thanks. Uh, Sorry, go ahead, um, Just, just going to say, I, I'm, I'm going to have to depart. Um, so um, just say thank you, everyone, and uh, great to meet you, and great to hear about what's going on in in Hackney. I mean, it's um, yeah, it's good good to hear, and I think we should be following suit in lots lots of parts of the world. So it's going to be in your next presentation, isn't it, Tim? But but that's that's that's. Uh, thank you so much for giving the time to this today. We really appreciate it, and it's great to hear from you. And and uh, thanks a lot. No, and thank you all. Cheers. Thanks, Tim. So, so, so um, we're almost at the end of our time anyway, and and uh, so, so we'll wrap up in a minute. There were some other questions. I know we haven't got to everything. Uh, there was one question which, which I'm going to just take chair's privilege to answer because they said, "Do we need more funding for mental health care, and and do we need to up our game nationally?" Uh, well, yes, absolutely. Uh, and of course, it is important to say that that, that the NHS long term plan comes with big promises for more money for mental health care, including community mental health support and, and uh, greater links with primary care. So, so we will, as a voluntary sector organisation ourselves, be, be holding the system to account for ensuring that happens. Um, I think there is a really interesting question about, about how we, um, I, I was going to say level up and then I thought, no, that's just too cheesy. How do we make sure we share and spread the benefits of this? And, and um, I guess part of that is probably uh, about uh, the time that, that colleagues like Miriam and Dan are able to give to, to sharing with, with colleagues across the country actually what you're up to and, and what you've learned from it. Um, are, there, are there any other points, Dan or Miriam, you'd like to bring in, maybe any questions you've seen you're dying to answer or anything else you'd like to say before we uh, bring it to a close? Just, uh, I suppose, just just one thing. I think responding to uh, this issue of involving voluntary organisations and different organisations in, in people's care. I think, for me, the most important thing is to think about what does recovery mean to an individual, um, and to come out of one's own kind of particular box. And and an example of this, I could give an example of this. Um, somebody might come to me and uh, from my perspective um, would, would benefit from a treatment for PTSD and in my mind I might think well that's recovery I've treated that PTSD that person's much better They're off. but that person's own recovery goal might be beyond that it might be I need my PTSD to resolve so that I can spend more time with my family so I can repair some of the difficulties my family has, has had because of this difficulty that I've had. And I think that's really important. If we all come together as organisations and think, actually, let's just think a little bit less in our own box and think more about the service user and their, their whole recovery needs. I think that really helps us to link in with our partner organisations. Thanks, Miriam. I think that's such a powerful point. And, and it's something that's come up in the chat that actually uh, this can enable a more whole person type approach to support and indeed more community focused as well, linking in with some of the assets that, that are around that, that you brought in. So, so uh, I think that's that's a brilliant place to, to finish. And, and um, I think lots of folk here will agree with that. We are at the end of our time. So huge thanks to Rob and the team at GovConnect for bringing us together today. 
Uh, big, big thanks to our speakers, Miriam, Dan, and Tim, for some fantastic presentations. And thank you very much to everyone who has listened, been part of the chat, who has shared ideas, who've shared connections. I've seen people sharing their email addresses and, and links to things. There'll be a recording available, and you'll be able to look at the chat there too. So thanks, everyone. Stay well. Have a nice afternoon. Enjoy the sunshine. Half of you, you've got sunshine. And uh, take care. Thank you.